All right. Today, we're going to deal with questioning, part four. And uh, I have a 28-part sermon today. 28 point. Yep. Just, I'm warning you now. Uh, the, the hike isn't until 1230, so you're okay. <laughs> Don't worry, it'll be fun. I won't finish it. You know that. 28 minutes. Oh, that could be, that could be really quick. Yeah. Well, before I do that, let's get into some of the things that made me pause and ponder this week. I love this by Robert Capon. What really made a mess of the world? Really? Grace? Forgiveness? Turning the other cheek? Or is it guilt and punishment, vengeance, and retribution? It's a good question. Hmm. I love this one. The gospel is not the news that we can receive an absent Jesus into our lives. The gospel is the shocking news that Jesus has received us into his. This fits the questioning series beautifully. Love this one from Dave Adams. When God says, vengeance is mine, he means he's taking the vengeance upon himself as we've seen it on the cross. And when God says, I will repay, it means he will, be, he will be the one to restore the things we have lost. This is the whole idea of vengeance. The Lord will repay does not mean what we think it means or does not mean what we may have been told. The heartbeat of the Christian faith is good news, not good advice, good technique, or even good behavior. In other words, the root of Christianity is not do something for Jesus. The root of Christianity is Jesus has done everything for you. And I, th I forget his relationship to Billy Graham. I think it's his son-in-law who, who said that. He got in a lot of trouble, too. <laughs> um, but this idea of what is this Christianity, um, we're, we're told we've got to do these things for Jesus, which is probably a good topic to hit at some point. We're not called to serve. We were not created to serve. I've seen those posters and those memes. I've seen Bible study books called created to serve. You were not created to serve. You were created to be loved and love. That's it. Are you going to serve in the meantime as a result of that love? Of course. But if we make service the purpose, then it's all about what we do. Very awful way to live because when is enough? <laughs> Deconstructing isn't a threat to God. God honors the wrestlers, the doubters, the honest. Deconstructing is a threat to the status quo, to power structures, to control mechanism. And those things never back down quietly. Press on, dear questioners. It's not God who opposes you. Permission to question. And that's why we're doing this series. So today I want to deal with questioning. You have heard it said. And challenging the lines that we've been told. Many years ago I, I touched on a lot of these before, but it makes even more sense today. So um, I thought I'd share with you some of the, you've been told. But when you find out it's actually not in the Bible, your eyebrows may go up. I am... My aim is to have at least everybody's eyebrows go up once. You go, what? So <laughs> that's my hope. If not, you're a good actor. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> there, Brent's already done, so you're done for the day. <laughs> but honestly, the things we're taught that are not in the Bible, we've been taught a lot. So either we're led to believe they were biblical, these phrases, okay, but they're not, or led to believe they were church teachings, the church has always taught this. You know, it's my Sean O'Connery voice. But it's, it's, if you're Sean O'Connery says it, it must be true. So anyway, let's get into number one. We're going to do a weird one first. The lion shall lay down with the lamb. It is not in the Bible. Um, don't get your Bible out, Elizabeth. It's, uh, trust me, it's not there. You can look all you want. You can Google it. It's not there. Because we've sung about it, I've heard, who's, who's one of the big worship leaders that, uh, Yeshua, Ham, um, Yeshua HaMashiach, um, the Lion and the Lamb, 
who's that guy? Wesley Brown? Scott Wesley? Is it Scott Wesley? I think it's Scott Wesley Brown. So you got all these songs that capture these phrases, and we're told they're, oh, that's in the Bible. They're using, but they're using Bible words mixed up. What are they talking about? Although Jesus is both the Lion of Judah and the Lamb of God in Revelation 5, this phrase does not appear in the Bible. Isaiah eleven six 6 says, The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a child shall lead them. That's a little different than lion and the lamb. The wolf and the lamb gaze. Anyway, that's, there you go. You can look. Google will do wonders. Internet has forced the church to start telling the truth. That's one of the blessings. There's curses too. But one of the blessings of having the internet, it's all out there. Next one. Hate the sin, love the sinner is not in the Bible. Although it's a biblical sounding admonition, it's not directly from the Bible. It's actually a loose quote from something Mahatma Gandhi wrote in 1929. Hate the sin and not the sinner. Augustine expressed a similar thought back in AD 424 with love for mankind and hatred of sins. So the, that phrase just isn't there, just in case. So this, we're going to do a lot of unlearning today. Cleanliness is next to godliness. We found out last week. Um, remember that Clorox bottle beside the Jesus statue? <laughs> that was really funny. But that is not in the Bible. The, this Bible misquote might have its roots in James 4, 8. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. From one translation. But the idea of cleanliness is next to godliness. They say it in church all the time. Moms told their kids, wash your hands. Clean. It's, it's, it's just, it's, it, unfortunately, kids that went to church in a very religious family, parents used phrases to control their kids leading them to believe it was a God quote, a Bible quote, or church teaching. It's time to question them. It's time to stop perpetuating a falsehood and dig deep. If you're going to use the word, don't assume. This one too, it's like a kidney stone. This too shall pass, you know. Um, those who've had one, I've never, but those who have, uh, this is not in the Bible. I... <laughs> So this is actually a misinterpretation from a line from the Lament of Dewar, an old English poem. Dewar was replaced as his Lord's poet and calls to mind several other Germanic uh, mythological figures who went through troubled times. Each refrain ends with, that passed away, so may this. So this idea of this shall to pass. We're, we're going to be really surprised by how many phrases are from literature and plays than actual scripture. <laughs> I, was, I was just stunned by him. And I, I cut out a whole ton that I'm not going to share with you. So this is, today's only 28. <laughs> Spare the rod, spoil the child. It's got to be in the Bible, right? It's not. This could very well be a paraphrase of Proverbs 13, 24, but the statement doesn't really exist in any translation of the Bible. The Bible verse actually reads, he who spares the rod hates his son, and he who loves him is careful to discipline him. Samuel Butler, in the 17th century British poet, actually coined the phrase, spare the rod and spoil the child, in his satirical poem, Habibras. So, again, another, another writer, not in the Bible. It's funny how things got blended in. Next, am I going fast enough now? God moves in mysterious ways. How many would have thought that might be in the Bible? Um, no, it's not. Um, by the way, nothing that I'm sharing with you is in the Bible for the, for the main lines today. So just in case you have to ask, no, no. If you see it up there, it's not. Although, there's, I'm going to warn you, there are some little tweaks that it sounds like it, but it's not exact. And you're going to say, well, that's really playing on wording. Well, you're allowed to have one or two, maximum three strikes against me on that. But um, it's still important to be aware of what the text could say. So God uh, moves in mysterious ways. Perhaps the phrase can be linked to Isaiah 55, 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. But in 1700s, William Cowper was an English poet and a hymnist. Uh, one William Cowper poem said, Light shining up darkness reads, God works in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. 
So there are hymn lines that people think are in the scripture. Now here's where I find difficult, and I'm going to touch on at some point the horrific theology in songs. We're going to cover that at some point because I want to find a way to talk about some of the songs we sing, great tunes, we love them, they're, oh, I love this song, and then you find out some of the lines, like, that's in that song, oh my goodness, I can't sing that, Um, and that's okay, which means there's some really great stuff in the songs, and there's some horrible theology in the songs as well. We need to be aware of that, just because we sing it on Sunday, even even our song list in the last, uh, last couple years, there are songs that have really bad lines in them, but we're not going to become gracilistic. There's still value to having some of those songs. We're not all, not all in the same place. There's value to them. So I want to be careful with that. But our songs have taught us things. Pride comes before the fall um, is not in the Bible. Uh, Linda knew that already. This phrase often attributed to the Bible is almost correct. The actual verse found in Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. So it's a kind of a shortened version of it, but it's not really, the phrase is not there. Number eight, God helps those who help themselves. I I grew up with this when I heard it. and Honestly, I I thought it was in the Bible, um, but clearly it's not because it's up here. The earliest recording of this saying is actually from Aesop's fable. Look at that. Hercules and the Wagoner. A man's wagon got stuck in a muddy road, and he prayed for Hercules to help. Hercules appeared and said, get up and put your shoulder to the wheel. The moral given was that gods help them that help themselves. So, different God. (laughs) Isn't that funny? Next, money is the root of all evil. This one's important. It is not in the Bible. Some of you say, well, I, I, I know it is. Well, I know you're wrong. And now this is, I know I shouldn't be dealing with right and wrong, and I'm right, you're not, and vice versa. But this is a cheeky, fun way to do this, all right? I'm, I'm trying to have some fun here, so please go with me on this. But this one has been mistaken. It is not there. Instead, this misquote is not too far off from the actual verse found in 1 Timothy 6.10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Money is not good or bad. And being wealthy is not a sin. Jacob was wealthy and described as a man who was blameless, upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. Abraham was wealthy. There were others that were wealthy. Being wealthy is not a sin. We've got to get that out of our minds because those that aren't as wealthy judge those who are wealthy while they have, they can have better ways to spend their money You know, because you're doing it from a place of lack. And those that have money judge those that don't and why aren't you doing disciplines, like it's, it's crazy, so let's just not judge. Let's just stop that. But the idea here is when people quote money is the root of all evil, and I still hear today, from good people, even some pastors, they still say it, but it says the love of money is, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. You can, you can see how that can become a problem, but if you make that the phrase, you're in trouble. Do you, you catching what I mean? I hope so. Oh, oh, ouch. Ask Jesus into your heart, the sinner's prayer, is not in the Bible at all. Nor is there anything like it in the scripture. Hmm. The fact is, there's neither any specific formula found in scripture for a sinner's prayer, nor is there any biblical example of such a prayer being recommended in the salvation experience. Ouch. The modern usage of sinner's prayer originates in the 19th century and was popularized by the experience-oriented evangelistic style of Charles Finney. As scripture presents it, men should repent, believe, and be baptized. That's it. There's no mention of altar calls or sinner's prayers or requesting for Christ to enter one's heart. This could really shake some things up, which is kind of what I'm hoping for, because we need to wrestle loose some faulty concepts, because I think the love of God's bigger and better than that. 
I'll leave that one there. Number 11, God will not give you more than you can handle. I've heard this one before, right? Well, I'm, I, I know it says, I heard something like it. Well, by now you're already thinking, okay, it's got to be close, <laughs> right? And it's true, but it's not the same at all. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 actually refers to the de- dealing with temptation and burdens, not being able to handle things. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can endure it. Temptation is very different than trials. We've got to stop using that biblical card to see, God won't give me more than I can handle. I heard it last week from somebody going through some difficulties. I didn't say anything because I wasn't asked for my opinion, which is sometimes quite wise. Peter wasn't spared. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you that, listen to this, your faith may not fail. And you, once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Jesus prayed for his faith, not deliverance from pending trial. Ooh, we pray for the funniest things. And that's another one we got to tackle. What about prayer? How does it work? The wrong prayers we pray. If we should actually question some of our prayers you'd be shocked at the phrases we've used and have encouraged people to use. And it's kind of embarrassing. But Jesus didn't even pray for this trial to be lifted. Huh. Okay, here's another one. Once saved, always saved. It's not in the scripture. It's not there. There's a phrase people talk about. And I think you probably knew it wasn't, but... It's so often attached to salvation conversations. Um, At funerals, we get asked, so were they saved? Did they know the Lord? I'm thinking, none of your business. Really, what's it to you? What does it matter to you to know about their destination? You don't even know your own. Well, I said the prayer. I'm calling out the trite little phrases that we got to stop using. And once saved, always saved is one of those. First of all, slogans like this, once saved, always saved, are always regrettable because they polarize an issue, causing them to be touted or denounced vehemently, not on the basis of truth as truth is, but only as it's represented in the stark world of sloganeering. This is a fast phrase we use to shut up arguments. What we don't do is explain or understand the bridge of how we arrived at the phrase. And if we try to do that, we'll realize the bridge broke. But we don't want to admit that. It's an argument and a discussion. It polarizes the topic of salvation, which means a lot more than what we've been told. There's good news. I like Baxter Kruger's quote earlier. That makes a little more sense now. The eye is the window of the soul is not in the Bible. I thought it was at one point, but nope, it's not. It, it's referring to something else, but this is a phrase that's been made up to describe um, a concept, not a biblical truth. How do I address this? The Bible does not speak of the eye being a window to the soul, yet it does represent the eye being as a lamp for the body. Matthew 6, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. The eye is the lamp of your body. So Matthew and in Luke, they both do it. It's pretty powerful. In fact, I love this part. The eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is clear, your whole body is also full of light. But when it is bad, your body is also full of darkness. Jesus says, if the light that is in you, if that's darkness, how great is that darkness? Light of Christ shines through all things, all people, all the time. The awareness of that light is what's to be questioned. Number 14, three wise men. Christmas is coming, and people, you know, most of us here know that there's no such thing as three wise men. But there's a problem with church history and songs, and we've added in ideas and concepts First of all, the Gospel of Matthew is the only place in Scripture that refers to these magi. 
Uh, scripture does not designate the number of magi. Traditionally, there were only three because it's the number of gifts. Because the fourth one who brought fruitcake was turned away. <laughs> but that's, that's the guess of those. <laughs> A famous hymn often sung by the Advent season is, We three kings of Orient are. Now the songwriter, hymn person. There is no three kings. I know. Well, he can still like the song. There's nothing wrong with it. I like the drummer boy, but he wasn't there either. <laughs> Seeing the last line? Seriously? <laughs> he stole my thunder. But the, the idea of these kings, there's no evidence that supports this. In fact, um, it's likely they would have traveled in a large caravan given the, the gifts they were bringing because they were very expensive. So just three? No. The pictures are nice, the silhouette of the, you know, the camels and the moonlight and the star. Like, it's all nice, but whatever. Uh, if you're going to go facts, there weren't three wise men. Um, all right, and they were not there the night Jesus was born. All right. Um, he was, and also, Jesus was not born on the 25th of December. You all know that. <laughs> you better know that. All right, the apple in the Garden of Eden doesn't exist. What? It wasn't an apple. We don't know. It's just a guess. Artists have made it that. There was fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Genesis 2 and 3, but we do not know what kind of fruit it was. The apple grew out of a Christian tradition and may have been a result of artists trying to depict the fall. It might also have come from the Latin word for evil, malum, evil, malice, apple. Some may say it was like the pomegranate. Well, we don't know. So we pick a fruit. <laughs> Either way, it, just in case, when Eve ate the apple, he didn't eat an apple, all right? The fruit, just call it fruit. I know, you know, it could be, Mike, you're nitpicking now. Yeah, welcome to what happens when you don't and just buy it all up. And suddenly things begin to filter in that you never question. They become your truth. Yea, verily, God wants you to be happy. Not in the Bible. It's so famous that this statement is often quoted in magazines and talk shows, as well as boosting someone's confidence, pursuing his or her happiness no matter how much we like to believe this statement, it's actually doing more damage to us. Remember, our mere existence is not about being happy. Really important. There's a lot of preachers who preach, God wants you happy and rich and so on, put another word on the end, all these things. It's not about your happiness. Happiness often is associated with your happenings. There's enough in scripture that talks about being grateful, being thankful. Number 17, just follow your heart and believe that you can do anything. Okay, I'd be careful with how I react to this one. Um, there's one Greek word, scubula, that comes up, but that's all I can think of. Movies seem to be fond of sounding like the Bible, but no matter how the stories affects your life, this verse is not biblical. Anything is not our purpose. You are encouraged to hear, but the danger is there. Sorry, encouraged to hear, but the danger is there, especially during today when everything wants us to be running, chasing our dreams. But those dreams may not be what his, he desires, and our lives should be revolving on him, which makes us all torn to what to pursue. So, what's God's will for our life? Oh, that's another big topic. What is God's will for your life? I'm just trying to follow God's will. And if he puts it in my heart, that means it must be him. Well, we have learned there are external voices that speak to us. Not every thought you have is your own. Some are planted. So to idea of trust your heart, we're still trying to discover what our heart is and who we are. We don't even know our identity half the time. So if we live and buy a false concept of this is your new dream and you'll sacrifice everything to get to it, but you arrive at that you find out your ladder's against the wrong wall, what do you do then? Devastation hits. You gotta be careful with phrases like this. I'm not a fan of this one. I think it's, I think it's awful. I, I can, I can't for the life of me think of being an airplane. Right? 
uh, it says, follow your heart and do anything. Well, I want to be an airplane so I can fly. I can fly my dreams, but I can't. They, the phrase is too trite and combative, and I don't like it. It's not in the Bible. Everything happens for a reason. Oh, this one still is a phrase we hear constantly, right? Everything happens for a reason. It's not in the Bible. Nope, not there. Romans 8, 28 does not say this either. You can look it up later. Everything happens for a reason, except when it doesn't. (laughs) But even then, you can, in hindsight, fabricate a reason that will satisfy your belief system. The other meme I couldn't show. Because everything happens for a reason, usually because you're really dumb (laughs) and make poor choices, something like that. It was very funny. I just uh, laughed. (laughs) But the idea of everything happens for a reason, Romans 8 talks about God works all things together for the good of those who are in Christ, something like that. That's another sermon. It doesn't mean this. It doesn't mean God's causing these things. When we start to attribute evil on God, that God causes and wills it, our concept of who we think God is has much more maturing to do. Unlearning that was hard because I grew up in a system where he gives and takes away, gives and takes away. Remember that song? You definitely know. That's like this. Good God, good cop, bad cop, God. It's, it's actually a molek concept. It really is. Because you appease the gods, then good will come. It's not the God of Jesus. We've got to be careful. The phrase is not helpful. <laughs> I had to put this one in. Hell hath no fury like a scorn, woman scorned. It's not in the Bible. And no, it's not the one where, you know, it's better to sit in the end of your roof than in the house with an angry person. Anyway, um, this quote is not found in Scripture. The true quote is, Heaven has no rage like love to hatred turned, nor hell a fury like a woman scorned by William Congrave. Congrave. It sounds (laughs) Bible-ish, but no. Like Old Testament stuff, right? Here's a fun one. Two of every kind of animal went on the ark. Not true. But we tell the kids in science school all the time. Uh, there's a couple songs that go with how they come on the ark, two by two and all that song. It's baloney. It's not true. It's sad. I think it was the first time Noah tried barbecue. Anyway. In Genesis 7, 8 and 9 says, With them, all various kinds of animals, those approved for eating and sacrifice for those who were not, along with all the birds and the small animals and scurry along the ground, they entered the boat in pairs, male and female, just as God commanded Noah. And keep going. Go back. That's the one we usually pick. But go back a couple verses. Take with you seven pairs, male and female, of each animal. I have approved for eating and sacrifice. Seven pairs of each. That's 14 of a certain kind of animal approved. That's a lot. That's more than the two by two. (laughs) The boat just got bigger. We'll leave that alone. Um, And take one of each pair. Uh, Take also seven pairs of every kind of bird. There must be male and female in each pair. How do they find this out? Anyway, to ensure that all life will survive on the earth after the flood. So we see seven mating pairs of 14 of every clean animal and two mating pairs or four of every unclean animal. Try to do that math. That's a lot of animals. So no. No, it did not bring two of every kind on that boat. Uh, Pardon? At least, yes. But that's not the story we tell people. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Not in the Bible, but you all knew that already. The saying is thought to have originated with St. Bernard of Clairvaux. 
The seven deadly sins listed as wrath, greed, sloth, pride, lust, envy, and gluttony. Surprise, not in the Bible. Wow. Well, you better quickly confirm what you're talking about, Mike. This list does not appear in the Bible. There are seven things listed, though, in Proverbs 6. There are six things the Lord hates. No seven things he detests. Here's what they are. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that kill the innocent, a heart that plots for evil, feet that race to do wrong, false witness who pours out lies, a person who sows discord in a family. That's not wrath, greed, sloth, pride, lust. Very different. But yet we're told these are the seven deadly sins. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then you haven't been in church too long. And that's okay. You're lucky. But that's a phrase that's been going through centuries. The seven deadly sins, there are sermons galore on those. Number 23, forgive and forget. Oh, we'll stop there because it's already after 11. I know. Um, I have, that means I've, I'll finish up next week because I, I have 28 today and then I got like up to 35 for next week. So that's perfect. A nice split. Um, but uh, let's go forward. Oop, nope. Oh, darn. These questions, these phrases, questioning phrases, revisiting things we thought were in Scripture, um, and then I'm also going to touch briefly on some really misquoted, misused Scriptures that uh, have been used to club and hurt believers and non-believers and should never have been used. Uh, I want to break, break those out and put light on them so they cease to have power and rather spin and show a more hope-filled perspective. So anyway, next week will be a little more fun. I, I had a really fun, a fun one at the end there, but ah, oh, darn. I'll just highlight it next week and have fun with it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that you have your Holy Spirit that teaches us, confirms truth, teaches us. May we learn to question things with an honest heart, wanting to understand how you love us, how we are to love others, and just live in response to you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.